Good morning, everyone. Um, usually, I don't have any problems uh, being being heard. Uh, a lot of times, people just want me to shut up. So it's uh, I, I I don't think I usually don't even need any amplification. So I think this will be uh, be good enough. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, TIEC for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, as, as people have said, we've been here for the better part of a week and have had the opportunity to meet with uh, several companies and uh, folks at the universities and are, uh, will be here for another few days to uh, talk to uh, additional folks. Uh, one of the things that has struck uh, me so far uh, is that the, the level of inventiveness and creativity that I've detected uh, uh, in the companies that we've spoken with so far has been quite high. And so if, if, if that is representative uh, in general of the quality of invention uh, in uh, companies in Egypt and coming out of universities in, in Egypt, then there's a lot of potential for economic growth, and my colleagues and I at IBM are pleased to be able to try to uh, assist uh, companies here uh, by virtue of uh, assisting them with uh, innovation management and IP management strategies. Um, I also want to say that despite the fact that I've spent uh, 25 years uh, traveling around the world even when I haven't been working with, uh, at IBM uh, to consult with companies in the area of IT management and innovation management. Uh, this is the first time I'm actually in the Middle East. Um, how, how that happened is, is, you know, I don't know, but, uh, but I'm glad to be here. I do have to say, however, that over the years people have told me how the traffic in Cairo and the drivers in Cairo are completely crazy. Uh, but I, I must say that uh, after seeing it in person, uh, I have to fully agree with them. If anything, it's, it's crazier than they, uh, they described. It, it, it beats my previous uh, exposure to crazy traffic situations uh, in Seoul, Korea by, by an order of magnitude. Um, so, uh, uh, that being said, uh, what I want to focus on today is really uh, practical advice for companies seeking to become more competitive uh, uh, in, a, in a global environment. Um, resources are becoming harder and harder to come by. Uh, one needs to be very efficient with their R&D investments. Uh, one really needs to try to capture all of the creativity that's being generated by people in their organization, whether or not they're in the R&D labs, and they need to be able to capture the creativity that's being, uh, and, and innovative ideas that are being created by their customers, by their partners, uh, in the, you know, by pub from publicly available sources. And so we're going to talk about some of the aspects today uh, and, 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 and give some real examples of things ranging from innovation strategies to the creation of business plans and technology and product roadmaps. And hopefully uh, the discussion will spark uh, some ideas uh, of how these sorts of techniques might be relevant uh, to your company. Just to back up a sec, we're going to talk, I guess, in more detail about you know, how to find new opportunities, how to identify market needs, uh, creating business plans and technology roadmaps, uh, leveraging technology. Um, technology that you do not every kind of technology that you develop will uh, be appropriate for your particular company to commercialize. Uh, one of the mistakes that, that people tend to make is thinking that if your company can't, isn't, doesn't want to commercialize the technology because it doesn't fit with your overall company strategy, that you should just basically put it in a closet somewhere and, and don't think about it and, and chalk up the, uh, the investment you made in that technology to bad luck or guessing wrong. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, there are things that you can do to your technology, particularly if it's uh, uh, protected in, in a suitable way, to generate income, even if you yourself don't go into business with that technology or use that technology to support an existing business. And finally, we're going to talk about an issue that many consider to be overly soft and sort of, you know, in a certain sense, a, an offshoot of psychobabble. Um, but one of the things that is incredibly important for companies of all sizes is to maintain focus. And, and that has many implications, uh, as we'll uh, find out towards the, uh, the end of the talk. I figured I'd start out with a very provocative slide. And that one of the mistakes that engineers and scientists and companies that have been founded or, or run by engineers and scientists make is assuming that every technical idea they have is worthwhile. That because it's a, a scientifically sophisticated or quite excellent idea from a technical viewpoint that everyone is going to agree and the world is going to be the path to their door. In fact, the reality of the situation is that technology in and of itself is worthless. No one cares in the outside world in terms of customers, whether they're other businesses or direct to the consumer. No one cares about your technology. All they care about is whether you have a solution to fill a need that they have. A market need, a corporate need, you know, or whatever. Somebody wants this to fill a need. And most people don't have a need for technology for technology's sake. Technology is a tool that allows you to fill a market need. Again, this is you know, obvious perhaps, but if it was if it was that obvious, I wouldn't be seeing over the last 25 years companies that are created based on effectively the concept that it's an interesting technology, therefore since somebody that they're associated with has built it, uh, in the words of the famous movie The Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner. If you remember, I guess it must be almost 15 or 20 years ago now, if you build it, they will come. Uh, in this case, in the world of technology commercialization, if you build it, they will only come if it fills an unmet need. And so one of the messages that uh, is going to run through the rest of this uh, seminar uh, is that technology and inventiveness and innovation must always be coupled to the identification of unmet market needs. Okay, if you if you if you identify an unmet market need but have no idea on how to how to fill that need or plug that gap, that's not good. And if you have a technology that is sort of sitting out there but the the what what particular need is filling is not clear, then that's not good either from a commercialization standpoint. Let's start out with basic principles. Again, um, th th these concepts are not overly new, but they, they, they can stand to be repeated a, a number of times simply because in the real world a lot of people still haven't gotten it, so to speak. An invention is basically a novel idea or concept. It could be technical, it could be non-technical, it could be artistic. It could be a book, it could be a sculpture, it could be a chemical formula. You know, basically anything that is a product of the creativity of the human mind that has, that's new is an invention. Innovation, though, is where the money is made. And that involves the application of the invention, as I've said repeatedly and will probably continue to say, throughout this morning presentation is the application of the invention to fill an unmet market need. 
Sometimes there, there's a, a long gap between the invention and the innovation. One of the more interesting examples is the laser diode. This was invented, as one might expect, in a basic research lab. I forget whether it was at a company or a university. Um, it's a material for our purposes today. In the 1960s. And it sat there, basically unused, except in experimental applications in small volumes, until the invention of the compact disc player by Philips and the partners in the uh, 1980s. Prior to matching the invention of the laser diode to the unmet market need of high resolution, although audio files would disagree with this, but the general perception of the high-end um, uh, creation of high-end audio systems without wear and noise, such as we're in standard uh, needle red uh, long, vinyl long playing records, was an unmet market need. It was compact, didn't have to be clean, there wasn't any noise, it could be used in small players, including portable compact disc players that people could wear while they were jogging, as long as the compact disc player had a shock absorbing system that was sufficient to create, to avoid skipping. Um, prior to this, the sales of laser diodes, as I said, were small. Uh, the sales of laser diodes since the introduction of the CD player has spread to DVD players of all types, DVD recorders, uh, regular you know, memory storage systems for various types of computers. Basically, the market for laser diodes had exploded, but it was many, many, many years after the invention. So, you, you know, basically, again, uh, tied into this to this concept is the fact that when you are developing new technologies and are trying to start or augment your business, a new business or augment an existing business, you need to have a dispassionate analysis of the marketplace. Is there really a market need, an unmet market need? Are you too late to the technology solution? Are there competitors to the technology market to fill? that unmet market need? Are there too many competitors? Is there a competitive technology, including improvements in the existing technology, that's going to erode your market? You want to know, there is no such thing as perfect foresight. I would be, I would be happy and uh, overjoyed if I could go to companies and say, if you follow Dr. Halpern's three-step method, we guarantee every product you come out with will be a success. Heck, I could retire to the French Riviera. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but even with the, the sorts of hints and suggestions uh, I'm going to make today, that increases your odds of success, but it doesn't guarantee success. Uh, because one of the things that uh, we know just on the basis of our experience is that Things happen. And sometimes these things, whether it's changes in political and economic situations, natural disasters that are not controllable or knowable in advance by, by plain old human beings like us, um, can have a major effect on whether what we do is successful and whether our analysis our analyses hold up over time. So what we're trying to do is basically impart to you today uh, suggestions about steps you can take to increase your odds of success. And if I find the secret formula to guarantee success, you can find me on Crete or something, uh, sunning myself. But you know, for my special friends, I'll you know I'll let them call me. Uh, and maybe a Nobel Prize would be nice too. But, uh, how to find one of the, the key aspects, as I've, I've alluded to, is, is how to find new opportunities. You know, one of the issues that companies face today are not just in areas such as Egypt that are, are developing and have fewer resources and a lower GDP than the United States or Western Europe. 
Companies in the United States and Western Europe have the same problem. Resources are scarce. Okay, I, I mean, the current global economic situation uh, reminds us that even superpowers uh, from an economic perspective are not immune from the, the forces of, of, of and the rules of economics. So it is doubly important, particularly in this, in this time and in this day and age, to make sure that you are using your dollars um, or pounds, as the case may be, as efficiently as possible. And not let the creative ideas of your company sort of not be captured. You want to try to capture as much creativity. You're paying people and your employees um, as, you know, and, and, and in most countries, people sign employment agreements uh, that give the company most, if not all, of the rights to the intellectual property developed by their employees, unless the intellectual property is so far removed from the business of the company that it would be silly. And, and one example, which is sort of amusing, uh, which I've, I've mentioned a few times to people this week, is that when I was at the University of Missouri running their tech transfer operation, we had a uh, the case of a professor in the psychology department who had developed a formula for a new smart beverage. And one of those drinks was supposed to you know, improve your memory because it has a like, ginkgo or something in it. And, and, and the university had to go through a procedure to decide that technically that intellectual property might have belonged to the university, but it was so far removed from this professor's psychology role it had nothing to do with it, that the university basically said, if you want to start a soda company, go ahead. It's a free country, you know. And he did, and ironically, there were several of us, including myself, that sort of laughed, going, do we really need another Red Bull or something? It's been very successful in the St. Louis area. The stuff is in all the supermarkets now. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. But, but the, the, for the purpose of what we're trying to discuss today, um, you know, you, you need to basically make sure you capture as much of the intellectual property as possible. So, so what we're going to talk about now is how you can do that. The first thing you need to do is to realize that if you, you know, in terms of innovation sources, the traditional R&D lab is just one small source of innovation. You know, you have innovations from the rest of your staff, and, and we found out at IBM, people from administrative assistants to uh, IP attorneys to, um, you know, student interns, I mean, folks at all levels of the company can have insights that can contribute to the development of innovative ideas. Uh, particularly, what we're finding out is that people who have, are on the front lines of dealing with customers, and this isn't just at IBM, people who are on the front lines of dealing with customers, even though they may technically not have much of anything to do with folks in R&D and senior level engineers, actually get to see how customers and end users interact with products. And if there is any group of people that it would be worthwhile to, uh, uh, to, to capture their ideas uh, are people who see how consumers interact with products. Because they are on the front line seeing what the unmet needs of the consumer is. Do, do computers need better interfaces? Do VCRs need to be easier to uh, to set, and it's an old joke about how it takes a PhD in engineering to, uh, to program a VCR for years. That was a, an old joke. And, and finally, you know, companies have, have, have figured that out and have come up with you know, better ways of doing that, which, which is an innovation of sorts. You know, it may not be an earth-shattering innovation, but it, it certainly improved the, uh, the lot of people uh, trying to sell VCRs to those companies. Um, these days, it's not unusual to capture new, new ideas from your business partners, from customers, from uh, you know trade association meetings, from meetings where the people discuss publicly 
by definition, publicly available ideas from your competitors. You need to have your antenna out and be attuned to the fact that what you observe and who you talk to in the external environment can provide you with the, uh, some of the fuel you need to develop new innovative ideas and identify new technologies and new unmet needs that can be put together to create economic success. Another, in terms of operational kinds of situations, uh, one of the techniques that I've had success uh, with over the years, it refers to basically facilitated brainstorming. <laughs> basically putting people in a room uh, from various disciplines, uh, from various perspectives. Uh, so if there is a set of technologies that one wants to brainstorm around, uh, that overlap in the areas of material science and electrical engineering and software development. You know, you, you have a group of people uh, from both inside and outside the company, uh, from those areas, sitting around the table, <coughs> excuse me, uh, discussing uh, or you know, brainstorming on various themes, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, also having people with industry and market expertise. So you're not just having a technology discussion. is useful as well. And so basically you want to focus this opportunity ideation into areas based on the core competences of your company, on uh, some notion of, uh, of unmet needs that have already been identified, and so you can come up with ways of filling those unmet needs. And when you actually put a, a broad mix of people in a room, or in the case of IBM, you put thousands and thousands of people online in what we call innovation jams, you will get some very interesting um, ideas. Um, it is important at the beginning of the process to let the ideas diverge and to not criticize any of the, uh, the ideas. Uh, when I've participated in these workshops, I, I personally am a pretty gregarious sort, sort and, and, and I'll speak up even if I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe it's a Silicon Valley thing, I, I, I don't know. And so sometimes I'll come up with good ideas, and sometimes I'll come up with ideas that are ultimately sort of silly. But the important thing is to let people hear the silly ideas because the silly ideas may prompt a thought in somebody's head of an idea that's very, very good. And the last thing you want to do is put somebody down at a meeting like this and say, oh, that's stupid. Because that person is not going to talk again. Okay, you, don't, you want to incentivize participation. You don't want to incentivize, I better not speak up because the, the boss will think I'm stupid. Um, and, 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 so that's a very, very important, uh, important point. And also, you want people to think outside the box. You don't want people just to keep repeating ideas that have uh, uh, already been brought up in any one of a, a number of other forums. Uh, you want uh, people to take risks. And so you let, the thing, based on the themes that you've set out at the beginning, you let the conversation roll. And you record, you have people there recording the results, and I don't think we're going to talk about the recording process specifically today because there's too much to talk about, but, but that's information that, that I'd certainly be willing to share offline and, and, and back channel as well. After, you, you know, the, these uh, jam sessions or workshops start winding down, at, at what point they wind down is really uh, a function of the type of people you have at the workshop, the number of people you have at the workshop, and how tightly you define the area of brainstorming. But no matter when they run down, you can be assured of at least one thing. You're going to have too many ideas to deal with in terms of an evaluation process, an in-depth evaluation process. 
So you've got to think of ways now to start converging on what the actionable items are going to be. Um, there are a couple of techniques that can be used to do that. One is to basically cluster the ideas into thematic groups that can be considered together, uh, where the evaluation of one idea is likely to be very similar to the evaluation of another idea. Then you can evaluate the, the ideas uh, based on certain criteria, and I'll be actually forwarding some information to TIEC about dealing with those criteria within the next week. And, and I presume those will be available to, to folks who, who are interested. Um, you need to rank the ideas or groups of ideas and in order to, based on the criteria that are important to your particular company. So there's no, again, there's no secret formula here that if you, your idea scores high in these five areas, you're guaranteed success for two reasons. Number one, we've already talked about stuff happens and number two, every company has a different set of criteria. I've worked with companies who, who buy into the standard, essentially, we're, we're just into the market size. We only want ideas that are going to have a market of at least $100 million a year, let's say, uh, yeah, for five years. Other people are more interested in barriers to entry. And so they only want to follow up and pursue uh, the markets that where they can have sufficient patent protection to keep others out of the market for a significant period of time. And, and you know, you can, you can make the same kind of analysis about, about criteria such as return on investment, market growth rate, etc., etc. So basically, in this, in this general process, uh, at first, you let as many ideas out onto the table as possible, even ones that are ultimately not all that brilliant or have already been done. Then you focus your, your uh, you use various quick evaluation criteria to focus and create a list of small number of actionable opportunities. So basically, when all is said and done, you have four steps in this process. The brainstorming, clustering, the development of and weighting of, of evaluation criteria to allow the group to evaluate the, uh, the ideas very quickly. This is not something where you go away and do research for a weekend effort for a month in order to uh, fill out the evaluation criteria table. Uh, the idea is to try to get some kind of evaluation out of the group that's assembled. If you've done a good job of assembling the group, you have people who have expertise in dealing with various industries and applications and technologies. So it's likely that someone will have at least some knowledge uh, or gut feel for how the uh, uh, various ideas should be evaluated. And based on the scoring of those, uh, those opportunities, you will uh, be, have a ranking. Uh, this isn't computer science or, or, or theoretical physics. The ranking here is not meant to come out with an ironclad order. We're not talking about trying to make go no go decisions based on a group exercise held during one or two afternoons um, with a difference of 0.2 at the end. The idea is to separate the the A the A's from the F's, so to speak, in terms of grading. We've already talked about whoops, don't keep the Okay. We already talked about several of these. There are no bad ideas. Um, the out-of-the-box ideas and the crazy ideas are important because they often strike and get, get people thinking about the ideas that make sense and are actionable. There are some guides that are often used to uh, frame the brainstorming session. Uh, you want people to always retain a focus on market needs uh, and commercial and, and what things would be and ideas would be commercially relevant. Uh, platform, the development of platforms is always a good idea in theory because platform technologies or solutions can be leveraged 
across many different commercial areas. And even if you don't yourself as a company get involved in every single area that a platform can gain you entrance uh, into, uh, it does open up the possibility for licensing the IP that comes from this idea to companies that are in these other areas. So even if you don't get into, uh, the, uh, you know, even if you're a tire company and you have an idea, a platform with, which has potential implications in food processing, don't laugh, stuff like that happens all the time. And as a tire company, you know, Goodyear is not probably out to, uh, or Michelin, to, uh, to start, you know, Michelin Foods. But they can license the technology to General Foods, as, as an example, and generate income from their intellectual property. And that income goes right to the bottom line in most accounting procedures. So companies and executives and board members really like it. We know that at IBM, where we generate over a billion dollars a year in income from licensing. And that all sets our R&D costs, and it, it, it's, it's great. You also want to make sure that the people who are brainstorming are aware of your core competencies, uh, who keep unmet market needs in mind, and have some understanding of your corporate vision. So often before these brainstorming sessions start, one spends an hour or so um, hearing from the company involved in terms of what their views are of these various subjects in terms of vision, strategy, unmet needs, and core competences. But, you know, you shouldn't be bound by this framework. If somebody comes up with an idea that doesn't match specifically one of these questions, it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand for reasons we've already discussed. Clustering is important because you need to get, even uh, in a quick evaluation process, you, you, there's no way you can even do a quick evaluation of 200 ideas. So clustering the ideas into thematic groups is a way of, of making your job at these workshops uh, easier. Um, you know, oftentimes during the clustering process, one of the positive byproducts of the process is that it sparks an additional idea in somebody's mind. And so if someone says, wait a second, I, you know, I think this is another great idea, you know, don't shut them off. Don't say, well, now we're past the idea generation where we're doing clustering and sit down and shut up or something like that. Um, you should let these additional, this final spurt of brainstorming activity continue. And, you know, uh, the other thing that comes up during the clustering process is you start seeing how there may be clusters of technologies that could provide an interesting solution or solutions in related areas, but there's a gap. And that gap, this helps with the identification of the technology gaps uh, that will ultimately help you create a more positive uh, and complete set of solutions and a more positive and complete IP portfolio that will be worth more uh, on the marketplace. Again, the uh, ranking criteria are something which is unique to the particular company. And, and I will, you know, again, I'm going to be sending uh, an example of how to do that uh, to, uh, to TIEC. Um, here's an example from, from one exercise I was involved with. Um, you know, these are the sorts of criteria that were developed. In this case, they were developed before the workshop. Sometimes some companies want to do it uh, on a consensus basis. Uh, we see here that for this particular company, uh, the most important factors were market value and time to market. Um, with uh, everything, with the margin actually being the, the least weighted uh, area. There's no right or wrong here. This just fit in with the culture and needs of the, of the specific company. And every cluster of technologies that was developed at the workshop was rated by the group in a very simple way based on the, the scores and weighting factors. During the workshop, what we tend to do is we want people to at least start thinking 
in terms of commercial viability. And so here is an example of a, an evaluation template that's used at a, a innovation workshop. Um, and this, this was sort of an actual real one from a, from a company that I helped start that was making new high energy density capacitors uh, for use in various applications. This Joe Polymer guy gets around. Uh, you know, his, his name is on every example we're going to see today. Um, uh, but you can see here that uh, the important thing from, from this set of criteria is that there must be an identification at a first level of an unmet need. There must be an identification of a technical approach. There must be an identification of the benefits of the approach. And there must be something to do with a competitive factor. In this case, you know, the competitive factors are really broken down to platform and time to market issues. Uh, there are other types of, of ways of addressing those issues. And you can see that for the purpose of the, the workshop, I mean, this is not the kind of depth of market research that you would do before actually going into a, a new business line. But it is enough to get the people at the workshop thinking in terms of the intersection of technology and commerce, which is what you need to do in order to efficiently evaluate whether or not you want to protect the technology by patenting, and whether or not you want to do more in-depth research to determine whether there's a business here that needs to meet the requirements of your specific company. Now, moving to the general idea of, of you've got uh, ideas and you've done first level um, analysis of the ideas, you've even done second and third level analyses of the ideas. And I'll also be sending, you know, I feel like, you know, why didn't he bring any of these with him? Uh, some information about templates to show how the analysis gets more in depth as you go from stage one to stage two to stage three. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so let's, let's assume now that you decided that, you know, this three ideas, or however many, are ideas that you want to protect because you think you want to use the idea, base the business on the idea, uh, that there's a sufficient market to license, out license the idea. At any rate, you, you need to protect the idea. The actual process of, of, of getting a patent or to protect the idea is lengthened. And it involves the first an internal process of generating the idea and assessing the opportunity, which we just talked about. And then folks have to write an invention disclosure. Now the good news is that a good invention disclosure is based on that same needs approach, benefit, and competition analysis that I just mentioned in terms of the aim. At, at SRI, where I spent many, many years helping to start a technology management and consulting practice in California, the approach was known as NABC. It became part of sort of the corporate identity. Now, anyone wanted to start a new line of research or whatever at SRI had to convince the powers that be via this NABC analysis that it was it was worthwhile from a, from a commercial perspective. So going using the templates and the sort of system that I described enables the inventors uh, to write a, a, a disclosure that makes sense that allows the evaluation committee from within the company to evaluate the idea. That's what the IRB review and evaluation. At IBM, IRBs are very, very important. There are, you know, the uh, idea review boards or invention review boards. Um, after, you know, these, direct, these uh, IRBs are Pick, decide which areas they want to move forward in sort of a stage gate process. They go to IP law. Searches are done to confirm the novelty of the invention and whether they fit the criteria of, of 
novelty, non-obviousness, and implementability uh, that are needed to receive a patent in essentially all, all jurisdictions. Um, then the, the, you know, the patent application uh, is filed, uh, usually a, a temporary application or a PCT because that allows you to, it buys you time to do more research uh, before you invest a large sum of money it takes to actually prosecute a complete patent. Uh, the application process buys you uh, anywhere from, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, six to 18 months uh, of time. You then start going back and forth with the patent, uh, the patent office uh, that you've selected, or patent offices, who will review, start reviewing your application, issue sort of preliminary decisions on your claims, uh, make you change various things, tell you basically that certain claims are going to be denied unless you can show X, Y, or Z. And after a lot of going back and forth, after many years in the case of the U.S. Patent Office, you will hopefully receive a patent on most of what, what you were trying to protect. But it's a lengthy process. Uh, the U.S. Patent Office uh, had fallen into such disarray uh, that it had gotten up to seven years between the time you applied for a patent and the time one was issued, which is bordering on silly. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, there's some hope now that the U.S. Patent uh, Office will be given the additional resource it needs to do a, a better job. Uh, one of the things we've talked about over the last couple of days with parties is that the, uh, uh, there have been some uh, scandals recently, if you can call a patent the trademark office situation a scandal, um, where, where several news outlets have basically gone and investigated and found out that patents were being issued for inventions that had just a, an obvious prior art that had been, uh, you know, so it wasn't novel at all. The patent was issued anyway, which of course creates a huge problem in terms of incentivizing lawsuits <coughs> down the road. And the last thing you need when you have the diminishing resources uh, is to uh, increase the odds of having to defend yourself in a patent lawsuit. And that's true whether you're a small company or, or, or a larger company. Um, did, did, we, uh, should, did we want to uh, take a break here and then have someone, what, what, what were we going to do? Uh, I think we can uh, open the floor for uh, some questions. Yeah, sure. For uh, 15 minutes or okay. so, and then we have uh, an item session. Okay? Any, any questions, questions so far? Yeah. 
That is an approach that has worked sometimes. It's much more difficult than, than identifying an unmet need and finding a solution to fill the unmet need. A technology push is much more difficult. You know, it, it can be done. So, so you know, I'm not dismissing the concept out of hand, but it's it's much more difficult. <laughs>